Hey everybody, welcome to Linux Cast. I'm your host Matt. I'm Tyler. <laughs> and I'm Steve. And I'm Josh, because apparently I'm last. <laughs> Guys, he who, I swear to God. He who comes last gets <laughs> most of the gold. From now on, I swear I'm just going to introduce everybody. I'm just like, I, hello, I'm Matt, and that's Tyler, Steve, and Josh. Those are the fellas. We're here for the Linux cast. I won't have to rely on you guys remembering the things that I said literally 30 seconds beforehand. In order to Why, not? Right. Why, Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Do it. Do it. Do it. I'm okay. No. Okay. All right. <laughs> we, we, we cracked Tyler up, which is good. As long as we're entertaining Tyler, I'm sure we're <laughs> going to be fine. It's going right. to be a good one today. Yeah, anyways, <laughs> welcome to the Linux Cast, guys. We are back for another episode. By the way, this is our third episode in a row, which is actually kind of impressive for us, because normally we don't do that many in a row. <laughs> Usually we have to take some weeks off and stay as far away from each other as possible, because they can't get the order right, and I'm going to murder them all. <laughs> yep. Seriously, it's all their fault. Uh, nothing ever goes. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this is Linux Cast. We talk Linuxy things. That's what we're planning to do today. We have a wonderful topic for you guys. It's going to be yeah. awesome. I'm sure we're going to have a lot to say about it. It's definitely going to be better than all the rest of the topics we've ever had. There'll be no ta- tangents whatsoever. Uh, we've never done that. We're going to stay right on topic. Cryoxin, I don't know if that's your name, but I understand that people in the video can see the names, but this is actually, I don't know if anybody knows this, but this is actually a primarily audio podcast. <laughs> Surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> the vast majority of the people who listen to this actually are doing so via, uh, you know, audio. So we have to say our names, otherwise people won't know who's speaking. Uh, most people have already listened, so they would know, but still. We're not quite famous, famous enough to not uh, introduce ourselves. Anyways. We're going to have a good time. We're definitely not going to be uh, diverted by people in chat. <laughs> Anyways, but before we jump into the topic, now that Matt's got his head back on straight, we're going to talk about what we've done this week in open source, FOSS, all that stuff. So, uh, Josh thinks how you went last and we're really pissy about it. Uh, you can go first. <laughs> what, have you, what have you been doing this week in open source? <laughs> uh, I have been troubleshooting servers all week because, you know, we've had... Uh, over at work, we started having some hardware failures on our brand new uh, IBM servers. Well, they're not IBM, they're Lenovo servers, but whatever. But yeah, I, I suddenly hate Lenovo with a passion. Because, you know, uh, th- I call the support line and immediately I'm talking to a person that doesn't speak English at all. Mm-hmm. And I, I, hit, I hit one for English. I don't, I don't know how to speak the, whatever language you're speaking to me. Well, but yeah, that that was my Monday, and then my Tuesday, I finally got a hold of somebody that that would actually be able to speak a, the same language as me, and we we quickly determined that the the backplane for for the SAS drives that 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 are in the server, uh, the backplane just uh, prematurely failed. So then I had to, I I ordered a backplane, and the only way I could get it is if I could drive all the way up to the north end of Indiana. Go pick it up and then bring it back to work because uh, this was manufacturing critical and had our had our entire facility shut down. <laughs> like oh, this wow. is seeming awful similar to uh, what happened with Toyota, like not that long ago. <laughs> so you actually had to drive like drive all the way out there and come back seven and a half hours one way. Like you actually had to drive to Indiana. Yeah, you you, you know if there's one state in the union that's worse than Ohio, it's Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I hope I, at least I hope their roads are paved. <laughs> I, I hope your coworkers in, like you know like you because that's a nice gesture. <laughs> Spend fourteen hopefully, hours going. Hopefully and you got reimbursed spark. for gas. <laughs> uh, it, yeah. It's called I reimburse myself because I have the job title of stakeholder. <laughs> well, that sucks. helps. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Just that extra incentive. <laughs> But uh, was there anything open source that was done? Uh, well, I did have to rebalance the ButterFS array after I got the SAS controllers up and running again, but that was about it. Mm-hmm. You did distro hacking with Linux from scratch. I, I, I did do that. distro hacking with Linux from scratch, yes. I successfully and distracted you and got you to play 0AD. Success. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, you, only delayed us for, you only delayed us for about 20 minutes because I, that's, how, that's how long it took me to lose the game. It was a good game. It would have lasted longer than me because I... Horrible at that game. <laughs> All right, uh, Steve, what have you been doing this week in open source? 
Okay. Uh, first, I need to start off by saying uh, Muhammad Zahid bin Hon. Uh, 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 after that, I'm going to say I've been up to a lot. Uh, I've been w working with the Grub people to get the XFS issue finalized because they fixed it. They were contacting me via the uh, that email thing, whatever it's called, the email list that people call it email list. I don't know. Yeah, uh, mailing list. Mailing list. Yeah. Uh, so we went back and forth until we finally got uh, after three releases pushed to Arch. I don't know why they pushed it to Arch, the maintainer of Grub on Arch. Why did they put it? Uh, why did he publicize it? Uh, pub made it made it public. But anyway. Finally today with the RC, uh, RC uh, with the dash four, the fourth release finally fixed. The patch was included, and uh, I've been working on an update for the Zero Linux tool where people now can now install this uh, and set up DistroBox with Docker. And please, Josh, don't say anything about Docker. Uh, it will set it up for for the user without the user doing anything, and then it provides the top five. Uh, images, which is uh, Debian 12, Bookworm, uh, Fedora 39, OpenSUSE, Tumbleweed, Void, and to make Josh uh, Josh uh, followers happy, Gentoo. So five different, completely different distros, because I didn't want to have multiple Debian distros or multiple. And since it's on Arch, I wasn't going to provide Arch. So I created that. And... I started a reading a book teaching teaching me how to successfully use bash without making my code dirty. How to clean up your bash code. Oh, so you're re reading that like rules of power book. Kind of thing. Yeah, that kind of thing. It, <laughs> is it, 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 it written by Terminal for Life? <laughs> I don't know who it's written by. I read it's, that book. It, <laughs> it, it, it's only it, it, it's only two hundred pages long. It's not very long. Does it have pictures? Because if it doesn't have pictures, it's <laughs> mostly pictures. It's mostly pictures. It's, uh, it's mostly thumbnails with descriptions underneath it. Uh, I, I read pictures nice better wolf. than I read text. I read uh, pictures better than I read text. Come on. Oh, okay. uh, and uh, finally, finally, to end to end things out, I am playing around with the Gen two. Distrobox image. I'm finally understanding why people go crazy when they use Gen 2. Thank you, Josh, for teaching me how to update. You're welcome. That was my first step. Now I know how to pull packages and build packages. Well, not next, completely. I'm still learn still use flags. Stuff. That's the next yeah. part. You got to learn how to use use flags because that's Ye that's the power of Gen 2. And then, then no, after you learn use flags, and then you get to learn how to tune your compiler for even more performance. Well, first I want uh, I really want to play around with something called that, that Matt hates that's called Sisyphus. That's on Redcore. Oh, only on Redcore? Uh, yes, yeah, it's, that, that, it's a Python front end for emerge or or uh porridge, so don't worry about it. Can't I use it? Yeah. Can't I use it on Gentoo? I like the name. Probably. You might be able to. I have you no idea. I wanted to, but I why would you want to? Cuz I like the name. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you because, could just write because, an alias. For no, no, like I'll, just, I'll, I'll, I'll explain why I like the name because fis in Arabic me in Arabic means fart. Okay. Oh, sis fart. I like it. Sis fart. I like it. Because <laughs> that's what Gentoo does. Guys. It farts. <laughs> All right. It farts uh, in your face. <laughs> Tyler, what have you been doing this week? Uh, well. So, uh, I mean, I still got Pop! OS on the laptop that is right back there. Pop! OS has been good. Still using it. Uh, I got the desktop computer. Uh, doesn't have its NVMe drive in, uh, but I've got the Windows install that I want on it all set up. Don't worry. It's not like I'm living in Windows. Well, I have been for the past couple of days, but that's just because I haven't been able, able to make up my mind on what I'm going to install on my NVMe drive. It's obviously going to be Gen 2. I think it's, well, uh, I think it's going to be Debian um, or something just because it's finally up to date enough to where it supports all my hardware. And I don't really need, and, and, I don't, I'm only going to be using this for like 
maybe doing podcast like maybe like the most creative stuff i'll be doing is like pot doing the podcast with you boys so i don't really need anything special or like up to date or anything like that like i'm just I'll be use fine. It, just use lmde mm, no i don't like it um i mean even if i go with debian it's gonna be it's it's probably gonna be a window manager just just because like i can okay but yeah, that's, I mean, I really haven't been up up and doing all that much other than just, like, absolutely trying to derail anybody else who's doing something productive. Yeah. Um, you know. he's, been, he's been trolling the whole week. <laughs> I wouldn't say it trolling. I'm, I'm just literally trying to stop people from being productive. You're, you're, and not, play you're not going to be playing uh, Zero ID on that thing? Well, I mean, Zero ID is installed even on Windows. I, I keep, I, I am, all right, look, I have turned into the worst Zero AD shill ever it's installed on every single one it's even installed on my steam deck like, which if it I was installed know. on your phone then we know that was true <laughs> uh i use me, an let iphone me, let me install it on my can... phone real quick here hold on, but <laughs> do you, hold on hold on can you get zero ad on an iphone listen in the app store uh this is a pine phone sir I know it is. That's not. It's not the question. <laughs> the question is, can I get it on an iPhone? Because hey, then I'm in serious Ty- trouble. Tyler, when you first got the um, iPhone, you talked about an, an app called like what ISH or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can, I use it could, on my iPad. Could you theoretically install Zero AD in that? It probably doesn't come with an X server or anything like that, right? Well, I do believe that there has been some work on getting. GUI or desktop applications to work inside of I-S- I- ISH. So I could do some looking into it. Uh, <laughs> look, if I start touching my keyboard, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get really distracted and not participate in this podcast Ooh, at all. We're enablers so, is what we are. <laughs> not doing it. <laughs> yes. Well, here, here's what you do, Zany. You, uh, you, you grab yourself a Macintosh computer, you install Xcode uh-huh. on it, and yes. which I understand is the, the quickest thing. I've I'm used it before. Do. Uh, uh, no, it's then, not. It's and then, horrific. And then, but yeah, yeah. And then you get clone zero AD, and then you re and then you recompile zero AD for your ARM architecture because you know we're we're using Apple devices, so we got to uh-huh. use a new hot like ARM. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And then uh, you have to attempt to load it and see if it actually functions to begin with. But you need to pay the subscription that way you can have the iPhone development kit. Uh, Already that got that. It's all good. iPhone. Okay. Gotcha. And then and then to be able to publish it onto the iPhone, you need to then. Email a ticket into Apple Apple's play, uh, store support. Oh, like, getting it. Hey, no, I'm, no, wait, ho- wait, hold on, hold on. I'll just go ahead and stop you there. Getting it put on the App Store, that's just a no-go. Like, I, I would literally have to go to Apple's offices, sit down and kiss someone's toes to be able to get permission to get it on there. Oh, like, well, then you're not going to get it on there. Hey, yeah. You yeah. could <laughs> use the, the test suite. What is it? Test flight or whatever it's called? Yeah, test flight. Because I mean, it wouldn't be for anybody else, but you could just use that for yourself. Oh, uh, a uh, question, Matt. Did you get? Did you try a Vivaldi on the iPhone? Yes, I did. It's it's bad. Um, all right. So, me personally, I've done a few things this week. So first, I've been playing around with Nix West. I don't want to talk about it. I've been playing around with Hyperland. Also, don't want to talk about it. Um, see my previous works. I'm, I'm talking about those. They're really not as bad as I'm making them seem to be. But I'm, I'm just kind of uh, not there talking about them right now. But the thing that I want to talk about is that first. I just want to mention, my Discord server is fucking awesome, guys. If you haven't joined my Discord server, you definitely should, because the guys there are just fantastic. Now, not only do they help me, but they help each other out on Linux. So we have this whole forum channel where people just go there for tech support. It's amazing. But the reason why I want to say that is because twice this week, my Discord server has just been... It just came through for me. So first... I had someone spent about two hours with me working through the problems I had with NixOS and teaching me stuff that I needed to know. Uh, and, and the second one is someone spent almost two hours helping me get hard because I've had a hard, hard time getting Hearthstone running on OpenSUSE, and I just it did, just couldn't do it. We tried Glorious Egg Rolls workaround because I was having the same problem he did, didn't work. Uh, we tried the Lutris version. We just tried running it straight through Wine. We tried doing it through Steam. None of those things would end up working. But what it ended up doing uh, is actually installing it in an Arch-based distro box, installing all the Wine stuff inside of the distro box, and now I can play Hearthstone on OpenSUSE. Distro box is freaking awesome. I love it so much. <laughs> it's, it's so good. Anyways, mostly what I've been doing, other than work and doing stuff for the channel, is uh, playing Hearthstone. Like a lot, 
like seriously a lot. It's such a good game. Um, I'm such a nerd. I for never, it. I, I never understood it. I never played games like, that, so I never mm -hmm. understood it. Yeah, you gotta watch some other people play it before we can really get into it. But once I did, it's good. Anyways, are you running it? Th are you running it through the BattleNet launcher? Yeah, yeah, you pretty much have to. Anyways, it's really good and it runs flawlessly inside of an ArchBase Scissor box. Like so good. I mean, I have to run it from from the terminal because I could not get the Battle.net export or uh, .exe to actually export to to the host, but. It's not that big a deal. I just run an alias oh, and it works fine. One, one question. One question. Since you uh, you are the boss here uh, when it comes to DistroBox, how do you get? How do you use Flatpaks in DistroBox? Because here's the thing: when I run Flatpak update inside of a container, it detects the Flatpaks that I have on my host, but it won't update them. Okay. I mean, I'm sure there's probably a way, but I'm questioning your reasoning why you're using a. a flat pack in distro box it, just no, i'm not using i'm not using i'm just saying when i run uh update because you know distro box containers use your home directory right and i have my bash rc uh in my bash rc i have when i run the, uh, an alias for updating the system and that alias runs uh, sudo pacman dash s uh, YYU and uh, flat pa and flatback update. It's uh, this alias runs both commands. You're gonna so, have to not run the alias, is what you're gonna have oh, to not do. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, for, first off, you'd have to make sure that I mean, if, if for whatever reason you wanted to have the alias work, you'd have to install Flatpak and get it set up. I mean, but why no, would no, I have Flatpak Kudu's installed. got I... the answer right now. Kudos with the answer. Uh, Distrobox dash host dash exec Flatpak update. Don't use Flatpak in DistroBox. Just, <laughs> just don't. It, it really defeats the purpose of DistroBox completely. I understand your your point, Steve. That you're, tr it's because you have the alias, and it's just running use one to run. But I, I would just use a different. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to create command. another alias specific for. I just uh, want to use DistroBox. That's my solution. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just. No, listen, Josh. I'm I'm using DistroBox to learn different distros without having to install a full on VM. If you want, if you want to, you want to install Gen two. It's literally the easiest way. But it also, if you speak to any Gen two user ever, one of the reasons why you use Gen two is because you learn how to ins so much about Gen two during the installation process. So you're really bypassing all the stuff that you're doing. So no, I'm not. I, I don't want to learn Gen two specifically. Just different distros like uh, Fedora, like Void, like. I want to learn the commands in terminal to get to get myself familiarized a little bit. Then I'll install the full thing in a VM in a in something. But yeah. first, I want to familiarize myself with the with the command in different distros. So I uh, I was just wondering, and I did see some solutions, but yeah. And one last question: Why didn't they create a container for Android yet? That is, uh, a, good question. That is a good question. They um, haven't because I went to their GitHub, and uh, the de one of the developers, if not the main developer, said uh, it requires a lot of kernel shenanigans, whatever. What's but... that Linux distro that does all the Android stuff? Is that Endless OS? Uh, the I don't e. remember. There's there's like Could a like a, a Linux distro that does all the Android stuff. So maybe there's an image for that, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, where sure do you I... see the full the full list of available images? Because DistroBox don't have the full list. Well, the their list that's on their website's out of date, so I don't know. It'd we be nice if there was somewhere. if there was a command that you could use with DistroBox that would show you all the list, the official uh, the Docker images. IO available distros. Yeah, and That'd and cool. Docker IO is not the only uh, uh, registry with with the images. No, the, different if, if places. You, if you look at the website, there's Q Q U A Y dot I O or something, and then yeah. a lot of the distro specific actually hosts their own uh, images, like Red Hat does and. Ubuntu does, I think. There's a few of them, anyways. They host their own images. Yeah. But um, DistroBox, so I just, I just wanted to agree with you that DistroBox is amazing. But just one thing, don't rely on, don't, don't use DistroBox and put your private code on there because if something happens to the to, to the bo to the container, you're shit out of luck. What are you talking about? Like if they're developing something on a container. 
and they have their code in the container. Well, no, the code goes into the, your home directory. Literally, they share home. Uh, now, if you were to create a distro box with its own home directory and then then back it up, you have a problem. Yeah, but yeah, that yeah. You have, you you have, have to do that problem. explicitly. Yeah. Yeah, because by by default it uses the host home directory, which is I think awesome. So, which anyways, is, yeah, amazing. Mm. Now that we've nerded out over DistroBox for a while, and I think we should all right. Seriously, do that every episode just because it's so good. Which I plan on actually doing it every episode. By the way, it's just we're gonna have a DistroBox corner, <laughs> just me talking yeah. about DistroBox for half an hour. It's all amazing. Right. It's amazing. It's fun. Yeah. All right. So Tyler, this week you chose the topic. So my friend, mm-hmm. what are we talking about this week? I'm so glad you're letting me like just, just come in here and do this. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna start crap between uh, everybody in chat. But uh, so the question was, are corporate back distros or really, I, I tried to put it as not just corporate, but just any type of business backing a distro. Is that good for the community or is it a good thing? Or I think kind of the way I, ref- I phrased it the first time was, let's talk about the reasons why someone might choose a corporate or business back distro. And uh, I have a feeling that everyone here is going to have some uh, like, again, Everyone here is going to have opinions against and for this, but the point is for at least us talking in this room to go over reasons why you might want to go with one or reasons you might not. I have one reason, so, only one reason to go with yeah? corporate back this road. You can trust them lasting longer than a, uh, than a couple of years. I, I, That's true. I, I don't That's think true. anyone could debate that one. That one's a pretty good point not even Community hannah montana linux died. is just, yeah not even hannah montana linux is true it is uh maintained anymore so yeah that's a good point i honestly don't understand how though for being honest a company should have picked that shit up real quick i know yeah right canonical what are you doing man <laughs> you should have had a, had a team there man <laughs> i think i think hannah montana linux was just ahead of its time because now companies realize if there's a joke going around and you get behind the joke you can make a ton of money okay. but here, now like here, here's something then, that is really scary there are people there are kids born that are old enough to, you know, rationally think. They're in their tweens. They have no clue who Hannah Montana is. That's how long ago Hannah Montana actually was. <laughs> think about it. Cause I'm like, I'm the youngest one in here. You shouldn't be trying to make me feel old. Okay? <laughs> like, you're old, man. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just saying that there are kids in their tweens that have no clue. They know who Miley Cyrus is, but they don't probably know that she started off as... Anna Montana. So well, look. If we're being honest, the only reason they know Miley Cyrus is because there are pictures of her next to a like turkey or chicken <laughs> that's <laughs> going to be prepared for Thanksgiving. <laughs> let's be honest. That's how most of them know. Um, let's just pause on Steve's thought there for a second. Can we? Can we just have a a brief, you know, tangent, if you will, about all the Linux distros at least. For the like, just think of the last f- six years since I've been using Linux. The number of distros that have just completely stopped being supported is just—it's amazing. And it's like, and it seems like it has. Like, if you talk to people who've been around in the Linux community for a long time, it probably is, seems to them that fewer distros die now than they used to because obviously, it, or at least if, I don't even know if that's true or not. It just feels like it maybe it's slowed down, but. Just since I've started using Linux, the number of distros that have gone out of, you know, use is it, just it boggles the mind. Like, I'm thinking, like, Antrigos Linux. Like, that was my first Arch-based distro was Antrigos. And that's been gone for a long time already. No. Well, I, I, uh, I discovered Antrigos uh, a few months before it died. It was good. I gotta be honest, that happens a lot. I don't know about you boys, but I've discovered Linux distros and then them die three months later all the time. Like, all the time. So what we're saying is that it's definitely Tyler's fault that they all die. (laughs) I've seen a lot of Linux distros that died before they were even technically announced. But, you know, like people would go like, hey, man, you you seem really smart. I'm working on this distro. Can you help me with the thing? No. Well, if we're being honest, that's kind of that's one of the reasons why community distros are extremely hard to maintain because like it's real easy to make your first iso depending on which base distro you're basing it off of it's pretty easy to make your first iso keeping that bitch up to date 
keeping all your users happy and attracting more users, that shit's hard. And you normally mm-hmm. need multiple people for it. And that's why a lot, because a lot of people make their first ISO, they get their distro started and then find out that they need help and no one really wants to help. Also, um, if, you, if you think about the personality of the person who's likely to start their own distro, and it's not universal, obviously, but the person, the type of person who's actually likely to start their own distro is the person who's also likely to be a really big distro hopper, which means that they don't have a very long attention span. So they'll use their, or they'll create, they'll create their distro and be on it for a little while, and then they'll get bored and realize that, oh, I'm going to go install Gen 2 again. Um, Josh. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know why you're pointing out Josh. I'm sitting here. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm, just say, I'm just saying, distro hopper. they're more likely to be distro hoppers than not. I mean, it's not always true. I mean, Steve is like one of the people I know who's a distro maintainer who's not a distro hopper. You're like an arch. Oh, I am. I well, am. Are you now? Are you, you taking up the mantle? Well, I, 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 I have a laptop that I have no use for, uh, except uh, staring at. So I've been installing distro after distro after distro after distro on it. So, yeah, I'm hopping, but not on my main machine. My main machine will never, because I need zero Linux to work on zero Linux. Yeah. Uh, but on, on, on that laptop, I've been, like, the latest one I tried is. Uh, Arch NWG. It well, um, get it, it takes some getting used to, but the next the next distro uh, I'm uh, I'm gonna be uh, installing on there is Void. I'm a, oh. I'm, I'm really I hope it. you have a good time with Void. Void is one of the most iffy distros to go with, only because it will work superbly, and then if it doesn't work, which normally is not caused by an update. But, you know, normally in my experience, it's it's like reinstalling it or installing it on a different system. You got a 50-50 shot. It'll uh, either work perfect or it'll be broken as hell. <laughs> like you only uh, got two options. Yeah, Void Linux, the, the installer will either work or it won't work. <laughs> yeah. I, I <laughs> remember, the Void lifestyle. I remember if you Josh get it installed me. and you get it booting, it works great. <laughs> well, first thing, first thing, I need to find a KDE ISO. Uh, that doesn't exist. Okay. Yeah, they don't do they don't do D specific ISO. So you do, you choose between no, there's a, there's a and community muscle. project. Yeah, there is a community project called voidbuilds.xyz uh, where they post out daily images. Where I think they might have a KDE image. Void what is it called? Voidbuilds.xyz. Voidbuilds.xyz. Yep. Oh yeah, they've got a KDE one. Oh my gosh, I just read chat. Kudos and sorry. While y'all are talking about this, uh, yeah, they he, do. He, Kudu posted a comment. I wonder what KDE Plasma will take from Windows 12 when it gets released. And all I got to say to that is, Kudu, why in the hell are you trying to start fights in chat? Why? <laughs> <laughs> why? <laughs> all right, um, guys, you get back on the time. <laughs> okay, so. No, but- but but I I just want to clarify one thing. The reason I said we can trust them lasting longer is, for example, I'm going to use an example that is going to start a whole fight in chat uh, and whatever. I don't care. And I'm going to start a fight right here in the podcast. I've been running Manjaro for two and a half years on my system, and it's been rock solid for, for two for, for the entire time. And I had, uh, and I'm enjoying every second of it being stable. And I agree with the fact that they hold packages back because I don't want my HTPC to one day die. I don't use AUR packages except one. But other than that, it's rock salt. Look, I got to be honest. If I was, if I was wearing something on top of this underwear, I would have gotten up and walked out already. What? That's the example of. That's the example you go. Yeah, you're starting fights. That's the example you go pick is Manjaro, the one distro that like should have not worked and failed like years ago. Well, it works and it didn't fail and it's perfect. And I'm gonna add one thing on top of that. While on zero Linux on this machine down here between my balls and my legs. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. This machine 
that has, runs zero Linux, I cannot boot uh, into the desktop unless I'm using the LTS kernel because I use legacy proprietary uh, NVIDIA drivers. Uh, with, on Manjaro, they, they have a system, MHWD, uh, Manjaro Hardware Detection. It does that automatically and it automatically keeps the NVIDIA proprietary legacy drivers running no matter what kernel you're running. Because it does the patching for you while uh, every update of the of the driver or the kernel, so they got magic going on there. It's a machine that's rock solid and up being. It's it's rock solid. I cannot you say need anything to, more than that. You need to stop everything that you're doing and get a job working for Manjaro. They desperately need you. Every person <laughs> they can get that says they're doing magic is somebody who needs to be on their core team. You can okay. See, the issue is that they won't ever hire him because their distro is green and his distro is purple. And as we all True. know, green and purple don't go together. Oh. <laughs> and you but I'm in, talks, I'm in talks with Philip. Philip is a good friend of mine, and uh, he's uh, Philip from Manjaro, Philip M. Okay, Philip so Manjaro. I don't have any thoughts on Manjaro other than I don't like it. And I can't. It's just a feeling of general, you know. Dislike. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, say, I'm gonna say this. If it weren't for Manjaro, I wouldn't be maintaining zero Linux. Okay, thank Damn. you. Manjaro. I wouldn't be on Linux to to begin with. You'd be a Windows user if it wasn't for Manjaro. Yep. Okay. Now I'm shocked. <laughs> yep. Of all that's, the distros. that's the way it is. That's the truth. Th okay. That's my story. Um, so let, let let me go back to the original question. When people choose Linux distributions, at least normal people, they don't care who is behind them. Okay, their n number one thing is voila, it, voila. Don't That's exactly interrupt me, it. Steve. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, their number one reason to use a distro, or number one thing they care about when it comes to a distro, normal people, is does it work on my hardware? Does it have the access to the applications that I need in order to do the things that I need to do on Linux? Those are the two things that they care about. They couldn't care less about, you know, is it Red Hat behind it or is it SUSE or is it Canonical? Most people don't even know those companies when they come to Linux. It takes a little bit of time for them to get past the, ooh, Linux is new phase to get into the whole free and open source they don't sphere. Even, they don't even... They don't even go into who created that distro. Well, I mean, they don't care. That's it, not the word. Maybe eventually they do, but at the beginning, they don't. They don't. They just don't care. I mean, it's not something. I mean, people who use Windows know that Microsoft uses Windows, but they don't. Nobody ever goes into Best Buy and says, "I'm going to go choose my laptop because Microsoft has." decided to build windows you know they, they go there because you know when they, you choose a laptop you do it because it's the price that you wanted to have and it's going to run the software that you want to run or you know it's going to play the games or whatever um that's the way no, no, most people like so it's, it's just not people don't take in, into consideration who makes what when they're making these types of decisions right that at least that's the way i look at it now non-normal people care a lot about this question right and i would consider the four of us not normal people <laughs> well by the way. i didn't i i still to this day don't care who manjaro are as long as the distribution works i don't care who steve created, who created the distro manjaro i yeah. swear to god <laughs> <laughs> okay i don't care who created the article uh so go josh so uh i use ubuntu by the way so right you're now, one you of the valid people too. running uh, a distro backed by yeah. uh, by a corporation. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's it's it it is backed by this corporation called Canonical. Uh, you may or may not have heard of them. It's a very small company. Almost no yeah, one knows about them. Very small company. Nobody knows who about them. Their CEO Mark Shuttleworth, super inspiring guy to listen to. Uh, d just do me a favor and just don't listen to any of his keynotes until after the podcast. But because I guarantee you, you will go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, he's not very. But, uh, enthusiastic no, no, no. <laughs> he, he is not very enthusiastic and that's why Ubuntu TV failed <laughs> but anyways <laughs> anyways so does Canonical do good work yes and no there there's a lot of very glaring no's that Ubuntu because uh, Canonical likes to push the buttons a little bit sometimes go like 
we're going to use snap by default. Or, hey, we're going to come up with our own init system. It's called Upstart. You might have heard about that. Oh, uh, what's this Wayland project? Uh, that Wayland project's been going nowhere, so let's make this thing called Mirror instead, because, you know, X11 is a, de- is a dying mess. Let's kill off all the 32-bit libraries. Yeah, let's kill oh. all the 32 libraries. Never mind that the official Steam package is a dead package. <laughs> I don't I don't know. Like, when it comes to, like, making dumb decisions, that's not exclusive to a corporate distro or yeah. a community distro. Every because like the thing is is whether or not you're a community or a corporation, it's exactly the same thing. You're still a group of people, and people are sometimes real messed up and also not smart all the time. So people make uneducated guesses on what people want or whatever, and it'll it does not do great things. I think the only disadvantages from a public relations standpoint with a company is the fact that you kind of by necessity need to be a little bit more open about what's going on and stuff behind the scenes and that just gives more room for people to nag and complain about where as in a community distro like i mean look if like let's say there's like 40 arch you know team members there's probably four or five of those dudes who have criminal records (laughs) <laughs> who have done stuff that you do not approve of, who go on to online forums and say shit under a different username that is wildly not okay and you would not approve of. But because it's all hidden behind a smoke screen, you don't care. Everything's fine. In a public company, if, if we're canonical and we let someone go because they're a racist or whatever, like that's going to be much more known and it's, and it's going to yeah. spread throughout the community. Like it's, kind of a weird thing and yes you did get interrupted josh i'm sorry we are yeah, 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 yeah. I, i'm just sitting here waiting just patiently go ahead just josh. patiently okay so i i know that i mentioned a couple things that canonical has done bad but what has canonical given us like uh so i'm sure sure that you guys have installed a distro that installed a graphical desktop environment like whether it be gnome or kde because the rest don't matter and uh you, <laughs> you've discovered you've discovered uh, GNOME software and KDE's Discover. That paradigm did not start there. In fact, the very first uh, app store on Linux was developed by Canonical called the Ubuntu Software Center. And yes, it was absolutely horrible, but it, but it did work. Okay, so to answer your question, what has Ubuntu given us, or Canonical in this case, the... Before Ubuntu came out, and you've been around on Linux long enough to know this, is that before Linux came, before Ubuntu came out, Linux was a beast to actually get it, up and running it and was. start and, and keep running. Things like audio and uh, you know display drivers and literally you know Wi-Fi. You know you if you anybody ever watches any of the old Lunduke Linux sucks videos. He talks about this stuff ad nauseum about how, you know, Xorg is old and audio is still broken and yada, yada, yada. When Ubuntu came out, they made it possible for the first time, obviously not immediately, but over time, for the regular Joe, non-technical person to not only install Linux, but to keep it running and make it useful. You know, now obviously, canonic- not, you Ooh. could do that before... But you had to have technical knowledge to keep it up and running, right? With Ubuntu, it was more seamless, and that's what they gave us. Now, I would argue that they used a lot of of projects from other open source, you know, people, you know, development teams to do that. But that's kind of beside the point. What were you going to say, Josh? Well, uh, the the biggest benefit that Canonical came out with back in those days was that. Canonical was the very first Linux distro to ship an installer where you could just hit the next button and just and successfully install your uh, distro. They were the first ones to actually do that. Because, uh, and it was a graphical installer too. That blew everybody's mind was that they had a graphical installer. It wasn't, it wasn't Ubiquity yet. Uh, Ubiquity came after. I can't remember what they called it. That, but... Uh, that was a very big deal back then because before then, uh, there were the way that you installed Linux was you could either 
install it through a, a bootstrap installation like you would for like Arch Linux without using the Arch install script, even though the Arch install script bootstraps it anyway, or uh, like Gen 2 or like what you can do with Void Linux or, and stuff like that. Or you had a command line installer, much like how OpenBSD does it, or uh, Free FreeBSD. So that's what the so Ubuntu pushes forward in that direction. It it was also the second distro to ship Pulse Audio, and it shipped a much better, more polished version of Pulse Audio than Fedora did. Yeah, and then there's also the big thing with with Ubuntu with Ubuntu, like the <laughs> the the major thing is is like Ubuntu didn't didn't all of the stuff they did on the desktop software side, yes, great. Definitely an improvement. We needed it. But another big thing was in actually sharing and getting Linux to people and in hands. Yes. Like, can, they did way more than anyone can ever all hope you, they did. All you had to do was just send them a blank envelope with return address on it, and they would literally just pack an installation mm-hmm. disk into it and mail it back to you. <laughs> yeah. And that was, or- like, I mean, at the time, like, that's how a lot of people got got Linux. Well, cause be- like, it before wasn't- that, you you went into CompUSA and you bought a CD if you wanted one. Guys, got to remember, yep, yeah. you, you you remember CompUSA? <laughs> I remember Circuit City. Circuit City? I worked yeah. at Circuit City oh. for a little while, man. Was yeah, uh, well, you, you also, they also, they also included uh, the installation disc with uh, the Linux magazine. Yeah, the magazines. Yeah. Yeah. And you often, t- like, um, I don't have one close by, but I have a, uh, like an old Ubuntu book that had uh, the the discs in it, and I have a Red Hat or like an original Red Hat Linux book that well, had the discs. This, in is, it. this is this is something I never talked about, but uh, back in the day when I was still in Abu Dhabi uh, in the '90s, yeah, I lived most my teen years in Abu Dhabi. I did try Linux, and my first Linux, I got introduced to the world of Linux uh, through a disc, a Ubuntu disc. Uh, in it with a magazine, and that's when Ubuntu still was running those brown beige colors. Yep, <laughs> the, yep, <laughs> the, the weird shit. Uh, uh, and that was my first foray into Linux. It didn't last long, it only lasted a few days because I didn't know anything. I was in my teen years, and we didn't have we, the only computer we had at home uh, in 90, the first one we got in '92 was I was 12 years old. Uh, was uh, a Mac classic 2VI, so can't install Linux on a Mac. So uh, I, I did that. I used the disk on a friend's PC because he was in between formatting the system and installing Windows 3.11 for work groups. Don't forget the for work groups part. But so instead of installing Windows 3.11, I was like, can I try this first? He was like, yeah, go ahead. It was a fi- uh, on a 500 meg hard drive. Uh, installed it, messed with it, and we since uh, we were uh, good friends, he kept it there for a few days, a week, maybe. Uh, and I kept going because we lived next to each other. I kept going to his place and playing around with the... Uh, and back then it was dialogue, not even internet. There was no internet back then. It was 96. Or so internet came. But uh, we started messing around with... Uh, with and, and the way you updated it is by getting another disk with, with the files on it. Yeah, and you had to point the repositories onto the disk, and you installed it uh, offline via the other disk. So uh, it was fun, it, but to see to, to, that's another that goes in uh, that fortifies the uh, the argument where you can trust them in innovating and uh, lasting very long. Well, uh, I, w- I wouldn't even say innovating. They just have the ability to do something like yeah, that. Yeah, the like, ability I mean, if you're to in a, innovate. Yeah. Well, well yes, I mean, if you're... No. Go ahead. I was going to say the reason why they can do it is because they have money, right? They, they, they can yeah. employ yeah. people to do the thing. I, I think Josh yeah. said this in Discord the other day. Like They can give developers money to do things, whereas the, the, the distros that have to either raise money uh, or... Well, or have no money at I, all. I can, I can, I can give you some real world examples of community distros that came out that were pr- heavily praised by the community, but they've done absolutely nothing to really push the Linux ecosystem forward. Uh, let's talk about Void Linux because you know we mentioned it earlier. What what does Void Linux do that's actually innovative? They have a different init system. Yeah, it's but run it. They didn't create you know, the init system. Though. That you, was 
somebody You else. know how long they've been using Run It? They were not the first distro to ship Run It. They are well, yeah. at this point the most popular distro to, that offers a Run It as a default init system, but they but uh, they weren't the guys that made it. Yeah. But what have they innovated? What have they brought us? They made package no. manager. They didn't make the first package manager. <laughs> but they made this one? <laughs> they didn't even You're gonna XBP <laughs> Void Linux murders, did not Josh, create the XBPS. Void game is gonna come through here at any moment and just murder yeah. us all. Well, hold on, there's more there, there's, what about Solus? What has Solus brought to step the, the Linux community forward? Line, uh, technically they were helpfully involved with Budgie, so you could say that they were uh they you contributed could. to the desktop environment. But you could, but now Budgie's its own separate project, so what are they doing now? Oh having the foggiest other than rebasing on yet another distro. <laughs> well, this is going to go on for a long time because if yeah. you're just going to name distros and what? be like, "What have they done?" There's going to be a lot of them around. So. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of them. So <laughs> let me point to the biggest and the oldest one: Slackware. What does Slackware do? The do that's innovative? Absolutely nothing. In fact, Slackware is all about living in the past. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, so when they first were the, created, weren't they? W- w- no. Okay. <laughs> Just no. That was quick. Not even. <laughs> Just well, no. Same Slack, way Slackware Slack, packages things is, is a little different. It, it Slackware is packaging things the exact same way we were packaging things since 1993. Well, and I didn't say they're different now. I'm saying they're probably different. I mean, <laughs> I mean the the only difference is that now you're not calling the make command manually. You're just using a bash script that does it for you. So That's the only the difference. The Void Linux guys and the Slackware guys were making enemies left, right, and center in this podcast. Yep. <laughs> so essentially, Josh, the point is, is most innovation when it comes to Linux does come from corporate-based distros. Yes, that that is my point exactly. And I th- I would be interested to see someone try to argue that point with you, just just solely based off of the fact that no, no, it makes sense. Well, like, innovation costs money. Let's see if Josh can argue with himself. Josh, name an innovation from a non-corporate bag distro. Ooh, I like this. Do, 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 do. Well, I could point... <laughs> not the I Zero Linux, point... please. No, no, no not <laughs> Zero Linux. I could legitimately point to Arch Linux. Because the concept of the AUR... Is was actually an innovation that they did bring forward. That said, PPAs also exist, but I think that that the AUR and the PPAs came out about the same time. Uh, Ross in the chat points out Nix, but Nix is corporate backed. It has there's a corporation yeah. that develops Nix, so yep. Yep. Th- that that can't be a that's not a community based distro. Now whether it's I don't know the history of Nix, so it's possible. To, Josh. Historian, uh, did 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 Nick start out as a community based distro, or was it started by the corporation? It, it started out as a it started out as a, as a computer science experiment. Okay, <laughs> that's really what it started out with. Funnily enough, and it's it, still a fucking computer science experiment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's never grown out of it. <laughs> Good lord. Yep. Yeah, that that's what that's what it started out with, and it and. It was. It started out as just a package manager, and then people decided that hey, we can make an we can make an operating system out of this, and uh, very quickly they create they created that the uh, the uh, Nix. I think the Nix package manager uh, incorporated into a team that then started that then picked up the Nix OS project. So it did kind of start as a community project, but it got spun under the corporate veil. Yeah, and, and now Very quickly, which also let's be clear about this: almost every corporate or business enterprise starts off as a group project like that. Yeah, that's kind of how they all start. Uh, one one thing that I did want to say really quickly because someone okay. said, uh, "Yeah, okay. there's a couple people." I see two mentions of geeks in here. The Free Software Foundation counts as a corporation. Yes, that's not the point that I was going to make, though, because someone said community distros send patches upstream. That is true, and I don't think any of us are making the point that community distros do nothing for Linux. The point that we're trying to make is innovation on something new that hasn't been seen before. That type of stuff takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, and that shit normally requires money, which makes community er, distros much less able to take on projects like that and be successful. Also, corporate. Go ahead. All I was going to say was corporate. That's different. Yeah. So. Also, we have to just kind of keep in mind that the vast majority of 
quote unquote community based distros are based on other distros, usually corporate back ones. So you, you name the pop popular ones, uh, Linux Mint based on Ubuntu, which itself is based on Debian, which is uh, ironically Debian is like the community based distro, which kind of proves all of this yeah. wrong is that their community based distro. Debian's that, the weird child, but right. you also have to realize that 60% of Debian uh, uh, developers are also employed by Canonical. Uh, well, uh, yeah, and I mean, I'm, I'm sure that other developers who work for Debian also work for other companies as well. Cause, so uh, we're not saying that Debian lives in a vacuum and is 100% community, you know, just like oh, we're we're, we're all one, we're, we are we are legion, you know. <laughs> so it's, not, it's not like that. It, but Debian is the one distro that is big and very influential and has distros based on it that is a community distro the other one obviously is arch right those are the two like distros that have a lot of ch child distros um that are community based the most of the rest of them are you know based on ubuntu which that whole incestuous family tree is really weird when you think about it. I mean, <laughs> like you got Debian's at the top, then you got Ubuntu, then you have a whole bunch of distributions that are based on Ubuntu, but you could really say those are based on Debian because Debian, Ubuntu's based on Debian. Don't think about it for too long. It'll just break your brain. <laughs> um, I mean, it just really will. Cause, I mean, if, my argument for Linux Mint, I'm, of course, you're going to take it to Linux Mint, but my argument against Linux Mint has always been that they bifurcate their, their effort by having two different distros, right? They base it on Ubuntu and they have one based on Debian, right? And just me thinking about the whole relationship between Ubuntu and Debian and Ubuntu and Debian based distros just made me think about that whole scenario again. Because literally, they they have a distro that's based on Ubuntu that's based on Debian, and they have a distro that's based on Debian. So, <laughs> just really, yeah. really weird. Um, anyways, now that not, so we've pissed off Void, Slackware, and now Linux Mint. Who's next? <laughs> we, we did the Manjaro well, I mean, people. <laughs> oh, and then, I mean, we could make fun of uh, companies like System76 who also base their stuff off of other corporate distros. But then again, that's not as... I mean, it it kind of makes sense if we're being honest. Like if you like th think about it like this, if Apple and Microsoft, if Apple was able to just take Microsoft stuff and then just do anything they wanted to with it, you'd do that. Of course, like it would save you so much stuff. Like grab their shit, <laughs> remove everything that's broken, <laughs> fix it back in. <laughs> and then they could release it, which I got to be honest. Now the more that I have said that and think about it, uh, you just gave us enough. Uh, you just gave us enough uh, enough material for a nightmare. Yeah. So <laughs> we should talk a little bit about the other side, right? About reasons why you shouldn't want to use a corporate back distro, right? Because the people who are really against okay. canonical, okay. and really against you know Red Hat based distros and and uh, you know SUSE based distros, they have points and legitimate points that I think we should discuss. So. Uh, just to move on, move into that realm, let's go around and see what good reasons would you have not to use one. Josh, you can go first. Well, seeing as I'm on Ubuntu right now, I can definitely tell you that there that there's a big one. There's a big reason as to why you wouldn't want to use Ubuntu, and it's not snaps. So if I run sudo apt update like right now, uh, let's run this. Uh, it they put in their server a message of the day, and it it should. It shows up once a week, just about every every time. The very first time I ran, it said that, "Hey, you know, you can buy you can buy extended support release, extended support for your Linux distribution if you just sit there, you sign up at this website and pay us some money." Advertisement. Yeah. So yeah, the built-in advertisements because you know sometimes they want they want to attempt to monetize. Uh, that's that's a big one with Ubuntu. Of course, there is a big Red Hat fiasco from the summer where it's just like suddenly they decided they were just going to take all of their unbranded. Uh, uh, un unbranded extra work that they were doing for free for for everybody, and they just si decided to, to uh, stop pushing pushing stuff uh, updates that repository, which you know caused a rather small contro controversy. And you know, we're, even then, we're still talking about it today. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, they they uh, corporate distros will then put push push uh, choices as the new newfound standard, such as Pulse Audio and System D. That you know people might not particularly enjoy, or you know 
Uh, dish, uh, corporate Disher is my drop support for, you know, a currently properly working graphical stack of known as X11. And just say, hey, we're going to deprecate this in the future. Switch, switch to this other thing that, uh, you know, uh, somebody here said that they're going to be protesting you. They're using it right now. I'm not using uh, it right before, now. I'm in Qtile. <laughs> before Steve goes, I do just want to say, I have a feeling that's going to be pretty much all of the complaints towards corporate distros is just the community has no say in the direction. That's yeah. normally everyone's gripe towards corporate distros. Steve, as it was like, would you agree with that? It's just not having yeah. direction. Like I, I think I think that's genuinely the problem everyone has with corporate distros, and it's going to be really hard to find a corporate or business back distro that is actually going to listen to the community, especially in areas where it's not going to make them any money. Like, no. Now, if everyone got together and was like, "We don't want you to leave Xorg. We would much rather you stay on it and keep using it," and will buy whatever bullshit you come out with in six months. I think a lot would, ch- like, it, if that's how the Linux community and, like, just tech communities in general operated, I, I, we probably wouldn't have that problem. That's why Ubuntu switched back to, to Gnome and why Ubuntu uh, decided that we're going to stop developing Mirror is because, you know, the community decided that they didn't want to deal with, that they didn't want to deal with it and they raised a hell of a stink with, with Canonical. No, but my, my, my point being like for them to stop that stuff, it saves them money. Like they were spending money developing out this new stuff. Yeah. So like if it saves them money, they'll listen to the community. And that's probably the only leverage we have is if we can save them. Canonical is a weird company in that situation is that they do oftentimes listen to the community, whereas a lot of the other corporations that do Linux don't. So the good example there is the, the Lib32 stuff. Um, they did that because they wanted to stop maintaining it, but it literally freaked everyone out. Like everyone who heard about it was like, no, that doesn't make a lot of sense, especially when, you know almost simultaneously steam was saying hey we're or not um steam but ubuntu was saying hey we're the gaming distro and you're going to get rid of the 32-bit libraries which steam requires to run you know so but when that happened everybody freaked out they listened they reversed it there was several other things over the course of the last 20 years or so that canonical has done that and then they've listened now they've obviously examples the other way around like the amazon thing in the bar that pissed everybody off and that was there forever, right? They didn't listen to that until a long, long time, right? So there's obviously examples of them. But if you think can- Canonical does tend to, I mean, just playing a little bit of devil's, devil's advocate here, tend to listen to the community more. It doesn't mean they always do. Now, as we saw with Red Hat this summer, Red Hat's the kind of corporation that doesn't give a flying rip about about the community apparently and they'll just do whatever the hell they want especially if it suits it, it seems to have obviously gotten worse since they were acquired by ibm where they don't really seem to have any um, accountability when it comes to the community because they don't care they're just there for doing you know they're, they're, that, that, they're that, that was exactly my uh, my argument uh, it, it's like uh, if if there would be one main reason why you, one should not use corporate back distros it would be the the fact that once they're co- corporate uh, based they're they don't listen much to 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 complaints unless there's money a money incentive uh, a financial in- incentive behind it if it doesn't make them any money they're uh, they're going to turn their deaf ears to you and they're going to treat you like tr- like you don't exist uh, I'm not saying they're going to treat you like trash. They just don't reply to you and they, you don't exist. So like the fans, the other users, uh, the community of users of those comp- uh, corporate back distros are not the friendliest. So there's... Uh, there's... I don't know. It, it depends. Because there's a lot of shit communities that are community and dist- or, uh, corporate yeah backed. but mainly 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 for example if you go if you go to the ubuntu places you go to the gentoo uh communities those are uh, ooh, toxic baby toxic. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that i agree with that um i think that toxicity has its place in every community i mean come on man you're an arts user you've never encountered toxicity in the arts forums before 
I'm not saying there is no toxicity toxicity in community based distros. I'm I'm saying that there's more toxicity in in corporate back mm. distros than there is in with the exception of Arch. I I uh, I wouldn't agree with that at all unless you're going into a corporate back distros forums support yeah, network that's what I'm saying. whatever that's what i meant well hold on hold on i didn't finish or you go you, you go in there and then you start complaining about problems you're having with a different distro or talking about potentially using another distro yeah then you're going to have problems because a lot of those people in there are heavily tied into like the problem i, I kind of get your point in this this might actually back up and embolden your point, but there is a lot of people in corporate back distros who have made investments either in that company or in products related to what that company does. So they have a financial incentive wrapped up in the company to defend it in their decisions. And so if you don't like their decisions or are trying to talk about going somewhere else or whatever, yeah, they're not normally not going to be very kind to that. But just just to make this clear, in community distros, even though people have no financial tie to the project whatsoever, they can sometimes be even more insane than someone has got a, who's got $100,000 yeah. invested in Canonical. Like, I have seen wild, wild people in both. <laughs> <They're>, yeah. <laughs> some people just don't need to be on the internet, if we're being honest. Yeah. <laughs> The, mainly the uh, for me my experience being uh, arch based not the friendliest uh, community in there <laughs> and you see a lot of weird shit being sa- thrown your way for no no reason whatsoever uh, so uh, now I, I uh, whenever I go to the arch uh, forums to ask about a problem when they ask me what distro I'm using I say arch I don't say zero Linux because as soon as I Say the word zero Linux. I am out the door before the, I. The, be- the best one is if you're like I'm a Manjaro user and you say that in the <laughs> Arch forum. Did you guys see that thing on my? Ser- <laughs> there was a meme on my server yesterday that had uh, some guy trying to make a heart with his hand and the- with his like girlfriend or whatever, and she was giving him the bird. <laughs> and he was Manjaro and she was Arch. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, anyways, I think when it comes. I don't understand why the hate if if Manjaro the OS not the company We don't have the works. time to get into the Manjaro thing. Uh but what I was just to kind of wrap this up from, from my end I th- think when it comes to corporate distro is is the the primary argument against them is that it, when they be, when they are corporate distro their incentive to keep innovating and doing things in the Linux space no longer relies on the incentive of keeping the community happy but instead turns to making money right and in a lot of places that rubs i mean obviously it rubs a lot of people in the open source community wrong right because making money equal bad um whatever the but uh, also they tend to make decisions based on that incentive so the lib32 stuff when ubuntu the red hat stuff uh, Sousa's made made um, s- decisions in the past that have been monetarily influenced, right? Fedo- Fedora making the decision to switch to o- Wayland only. I, maybe mm-hmm. uh, the my point is that they you know sometimes make these decisions that are. If you wonder what I'm doing, I'm trying to keep the dog happy. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not doing something down here that you guys don't want to know. It's just the, it's, I'm just petting the dog. It's not it's not a euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> I, I swear. Um. Anyways, um, I I think that a lot of people who are anti corporate distro are anti-corporate because of the decisions that those corporations oftentimes have to make right so yeah um it doesn't this it just it's just kind of the way it is also it, we talked about earlier guys that the like the distros that are based on other distros don't do anything to innovate we, we said and we we talked just briefly about not saying that they didn't do anything to contribute because a lot of them do and i think that well, one of the reasons why Linux has been kind of more successful in the last, say, 20 years than it was initially was because a lot of the 
the distros that are based on other distros have contributed so much back upstream to the more corporate based distros but um that, i guess that'd be an argument for another day so anything else to say on this guys um no. i don't know before we go uh, i just wanted to say thank you chat for engaging in a conversation about josh potentially being a lady boy this has been fantastic <laughs> 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 what? <laughs> oh God! Uh, just in case, just in case anyone out there is listening to the audio version of this and you know doesn't have plans for later on in the day, just treat yourself and go watch this live stream. But pay attention to the chat the entire time. It's been phenomenal this entire live stream. <laughs> yeah, it's been good. All right, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the thingies of the week. Uh, Josh, your thingy of the week. Uh, my thingy of the week, I don't remember what it is. Let, let me look at the show notes here. <laughs> oh yeah, it's Strawberry. It's a music player. Yeah, it's like the it's like the only QT music player that I found that I actually relatively like because you know I hate them all. Wait, Strawberry. Strawberry was discontinued like two years ago. I still hate everything else. <laughs> Just because something has okay. been not maintained doesn't mean we can't still use it. I mean, I still use. I know. Pyro. I know. I know. I know. Uh, we still use. Dude, speaking of Pywall, I maintain it and I put uh, and I ha- host it on my repository for Arch uh, for Arch Linux. So. Oh, are you fixing all the issues with it? I, I don't think he meant maintain no, I, in that, I, I, in that no, way. Just, he just, I just he built it. it. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Uh, here's here's the thing uh, that you don't know, Matt. There are still commits being pushed to Pywall. It's just the maintainer on uh, on whatever distro you're using is not pushing the updates. But uh, because I'm building the Git package, because that's the only package that exists. Uh, so since I'm building it uh, from Git, there are a few commits being pushed here and there. Now, I don't know okay. how important the commits we, are, but... We've gotten away from it. Josh, talk about your strawberry. Oh, uh, it, it, Because we did the exact played, same played. thing to Josh last week. He said two words about his thingy of the week, and then Steve went off on a tangent, and then I went <laughs> off on a tangent. Josh. Can we all go off on tangents? Can <laughs> Don't we please bad, let Steve? Josh, no, the poor man, we always interrupt him. It's me him. to blame. It's me to blame. Blame okay. me. Okay. So I, I'm seeing this here in the chat where people are mentioning like NCMP, CC, MPV, and all that. <laughs> I specifically said QT because I, when I'm playing music in a graphical desktop environment, I at least want a graphical music player because that's just how I've always been. But... uh. And I wanted a QT one because you know I'm using a KDE environment. I want my mu- I want my music player to integrate with KDE perfectly fine and you know look nice and it fit match my KDE theme. Which uh, Strawberry doesn't quite 100% match the KDE theme because it's got its own th- theming. It's it's a Clementine fork. Let's be honest with it. But anyways, th- it for just playing music, it's fine. Uh, I'm not the biggest fan of how it presents like the music library at all. But it, it is perfectly functional. Uh, I can generate playlists and it just saves them all to an M3U file, like, you know, everything should be. And uh, I can set up a queue. I can dynamically generate a playlist too, based off of like your newest tracks, the just ra- random 50 tracks, or like your most played tracks. Uh, and then uh, it even supports uh, internet radio services too. So uh, for what? just the purpose of just playing music that's on my computer, does it working fine? Look better than um, Clementine. Is that the reason why I use it? Yeah. Okay. Because uh, um, Clementine is you got his fucking bug away, man. <laughs> so bad. Uh, all right. Um, it's just like come on, man. Hire a designer or something. I don't know. It's it, it's not good. Um, Steve, your thingy of the week, please. My thingy of the week is an app. Uh, I have on my iOS device. Uh, it's called. I don't know if it's available for Android. I didn't check. Although I have an Android phone, but it's called TripIt. The reason I like it is because recently I traveled, and I discovered it when I was in Ireland. But I didn't use it. I I only used it this once when I went to Dubai. And once you, uh, the TripIt is a travel manage. It's a it's a flight management thing. Uh, where you sign in with your Google account where you got the email for your booking and it will automatically scan your email and then, okay, privacy people don't attack me, but uh, you have to give it access to your email because as soon as you receive your, when you uh, 
check in online, for example, and you receive your boarding pass, it will scan your email and add the boarding pass uh, automatically to the app, which allows you to add it to Google, Wa uh, I mean, uh, Apple Wallet, or if it, it's available on Android, to Google Wallet. And it will also remind you a day before that you have a flight. And if you want to make any modifications to your flight, you can do them from within the app. The app will contact the, the airline and do the modifications for you from within the app. Uh, and also, what I love about it is it will show you uh, public transportation in the country you're traveling to in the app without having to receive countless emails and doing countless things. It simplifies your traveling life. So I, it simplified everything for me. I found public transportation. I, I was able to modify my seat, my luggage, all from within the app. And it even uh, if, the, if there are any regulations uh, in the country you're traveling to, it will show you all the uh, relevant information within the app without leaving, uh, going through emails or anything. It's a neat little app. It's called TripIt. And if you sub uh, it's a free app, but you can subscribe. They have a paid tier. If you want to uh, use the premium stuff, it will allow you to do way more stuff. So like add your your travel documents, your passport, like your passport, your your image, your whatever, whatever they, uh, the airline requires from you. You can do that if you use the paid version, but you can I'm using the free version and I've been sticking with it and I rely only on this application for my travels. It's awesome. It's called TripIt. That's cool. All right. Uh, Tyler, your thing of the week, please. All right, my my thingy of the week. I didn't put it in the show notes because I didn't want you guys like looking into it, getting too excited or anything. Um, today we're going to be talking about my favorite music player, myself, which is a Windows Media Player, but I use it through Wine. <laughs> <laughs> I got Steve. I got Steve. <laughs> what the Thank hell you. did I just hear? Thank you. Thank you, whoever in chat, a uh, software lever. Thank you. That was that was the best. Uh, <laughs> no, but in, in all seriousness, no, my oh my thing my of the week is um actually something that I think everyone has used at least at some point in their life um a password manager uh -huh. uh, I, actually i did add it into the thing i just didn't refresh never mind well it's bitwarden um i had used let's see I, what was the last last pass was the last one i used and i think i used Dashlane before that i don't know i've tried a lot of different stuff but um i'm on bitwarden now i very much like it it's it's really nice you can self-host it yourself if you want very, very easy to use, straightforward password manager. It works everywhere. Um, so yeah, if you, if you are not using a password manager or you, for whatever reason, you're not happy with the one you're currently using, definitely give Bid Wharton a try. It's been really nice. Are Rock you using, solid. are you, are you using it self-hosted or <clears throat> online hosted? Online. No, I'm not self-hosting it. I, could have easily self-hosted it but i do not trust myself to uh manage the monthly payments properly because uh i have a feeling that i would put in a card that i don't normally put money in tie it to that and then mm -hmm. one month i won't pay it completely forget about it and because i don't check my emails hardly ever i might end up losing my bitwarden <laughs> server which i don't want happening. I don't think you have so, to pay to just put a server in your closet. Oh, you mean that the server itself to pay pay for the server? Yeah, itself. like to sell sell. I, I, I thought yeah. you meant paying it, Bitwarden to do it. Um, yeah, that makes sense. No, no, no. <laughs> I uh, I was self hosting it, but locally on my Raspberry Pi before my Raspberry Pi bit the dust. I use Bitwarden on a daily. But do you use the app or the uh, the browser extension? Um, I normally, to be honest, I normally, especially if I'm on my laptop or desktop, I'll just load up the website and just do it through the browser. I don't even yeah, use the, the extension or anything. I just go straight uh, to the login page uh, on their website. Uh, no, I, I use, I use the, uh, browser extension because it, it has the ability to autofill. Mm -hmm. Oh, I should definitely yeah. install it then. Yes. That would, yeah, yeah, that you, would save you go, me some time. 
Yeah, you go to uh, like your, the website that you're going to log into, then you just hit Control Shift L, and then it just auto populates. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I use. Uh, yeah. But I need to update. You just reminded me to 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 update the passwords in there because I started <laughs> because I started receiving a lot of notifications about uh, this uh, this website is using the same uh, password as other websites. Please update your password, and I need to fix that. So you just reminded me. Thank you. <laughs> now, like, ha- have you have you ever used the LastPass extension? Yes, I did use LastPass. Uh, the extension. Bitwarden extension does all the same things. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I. I. The only thing. I. I guess the reason I haven't. I. I never search for an extension, but I don't think I even saw like them talking about an extension on their main website. No, they don't. Yeah. They don't. But it's available. Oh. It's. It's by them. It's not by somebody else. So. Okay. okay, but the ex- the extension solves a lot of issues, right. and it has a dark mode if you're mm-hmm. using dark mode. That and you know since you since you're using Bitwarden, you you and I can share files with each other through, through Bitwarden. How can you do that? You can do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How? It's I did part, not know. One that. of their features, <laughs> and if if you pay their ten dollars a year, or whatever, you get like a what was it a gigabyte or something? Ten gigabytes. Well, I I pay, I pay for their features, so I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Where, where's the option? Oh, send. There's a send button in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is cool. Okay, I didn't know that. All right. Uh, my thingy of the week in the show notes it just says DistroBox, but I'm not actually going to use DistroBox as my thingy of the week. I should. If, if you were listening to the podcast earlier, we talked plenty about DistroBox. That means that uh, your thingy of the week is not invalidated, so you got to pick something else. It's my podcast. I can do what a fuck. I uh, <laughs> um, he can cheat. Instead, Let him cheat. No, no. Hold on a second. Instead, I'm going to choose something that uses DistroBox. So there. Uh, so, someone. And I'm sorry. I don't remember. I could actually go look. The the, the Zelikos, Maybe I don't know. Actually, know if that's what they go by. But they created a. I think it's just a script. It's called Da Vinci Box. And basically, what it does is you run a line. It creates a DistroBox for you. I, think it's based on fedora and it does all the things you need to do to install davinci resolve on any uh, distro. i thought that's where you were going yeah, i am what what did you say the name of it's it was called again? davinci Just... box i'll i'll share a link in the in the chat um because i don't right. have it in the show notes yeah i will do that later the um but anyways basically you run online you do have to have the davinci resolve downloaded in 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 your uh. downloads folder or wherever you have to point out the path or whatever. All the instructions are right on the GitHub page. You run it. It installs everything right up to it. It even exports it to your host. So you can just run it through your menu system or whatever. It just launch resolve just like normal. And it is fantastic. Because if you... Now, I don't know anything about DaVinci Resolve yet. I'm still learning. Uh, but I've always wanted to use it. But the one thing that I've always had trouble with is actually getting it to install on Linux. Um, and especially, especially if you're using an AMD card, the, you know, it's always had problems on AMD for me. That's just my experience. And this one worked with one line and it's awesome. Yeah. Just because you said that if you would like to do a live stream or just get together sometime and uh, have someone who's used DaVinci Resolve for a long time, show you around and do stuff, I would be more than happy to do that. Cause I like, you have given me a gift here. By the way, just in case anyone wants this link or something, uh, just hit me up because I'll have it saved. If anyone watches the stream and doesn't have access to the chat, whatever, hit me up. I tried Googling it. I could not find DaVinci Box, like the GitHub for it. Um, I searched DaVinci Box Linux, DaVinci Box spelled differently. Like I couldn't find it. So it will be in the I show. It will be in the show notes. I'm putting it in there right now. Perfect. Because I have a feeling there's a, there's a there's a lot of people out there who use open source stuff and have had NVIDIA cards for the longest time, but now because they're Linux users, they switch over to AMD and they can't use DaVinci Resolve because DaVinci Resolve and AMD with on Linux do not like each. I don't know what it is, but like DaVinci hates AMD on Linux. Have no idea why, but yeah. So that's that's probably the most helpful like thingy of the week I have 
ever seen. Like, I'm going to be on this <laughs> real quick. <laughs> I should thank George Castro for pointing that out. I saw it on, on, on um, Mastodon a few days ago. That's where I got the, got it from George on, on Mastodon. So the credit goes to him. But yeah, DaVinci Box, if you want to if you want to edit videos and you don't want to, uh, if you want to try DaVinci da Resolve, this is the best way to do it. So yeah, there we go. Um, anyways, another I think, win for another win for DistroBox. Yeah, it's so good, guys. It's like it is the future of Linux. I'm I'm 100% convinced that in the future you'll just choose a distro and you'll no longer ever have to distro hop because you'll just install whatever is drawing your attention elsewhere in a distro box. You and it'll just be that be the way it will work. That's the way. That's the way I'm going to use using Linux from now on. I don't need a distro hop. Distro, I don't need a distro hop. I just install the things I need to in distro box and carry on with my day. Open and, Sousa. Oh, that's for the win. That's why you've been lasting so long on Open Sousa. The secret is distro box. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's good. Well, okay, we do have to go ahead and specify for everyone listening and watching the last four or five minutes have not been ad reads for bitwarden or distro box just so we're clear okay if this, okay this, these have not been ads i swear <laughs> if distro box came to me as matt you want to run run an ad spot on your channel i would do it i, I don't even know if i'd charge them <laughs> would that not be an ad it's just me talking about distro box for a while uh, if DaVinci Box works successfully, I just want you to know my first video back will be an advertisement for Distro Box and DaVinci Box. It will be happening, like a hundred percent. It worked for me, so it, it should work for you. Anyways, that's it for this episode. We record this live every Saturday at three o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. We've never missed an episode so far, and anyone who says otherwise is a big fat liar. Um, we always record live every Saturday. Uh, if you want to get in contact with us, you can do so in any number of ways. Uh, Josh is at tenleyj slash contact. I remembered. Uh, Steve is at Fostedon on Fostedon.org slash at zero Linux, zero with an X. Tyler has a YouTube channel, which he promises now if the Vinci box works, he's going to make us a video and it's going to be awesome as long as he remembers what his password was in order to get actually into the YouTube channel. he can You can follow him there, subscribe, youtube.com slash zanyog. Uh, you can find all of my stuff, obviously, on youtube.com slash the Linuxcast. If you want to support the, the podcast, if you want to support the channel, you can do so heading on over to patreon.com slash Linuxcast or check out the store where you'll find t-shirts and... Uh, hats and cups and mugs like Josh has and desk mats and backpats, all sorts of stuff. Uh, that's at shop.thelinuxcast.org. That really helps the channel as well. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon. You guys are all absolutely amazing. Without you, the channel just would not be anywhere near where it is right now. So thank you so very, very much for your support. I truly, honestly do appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Again, every Saturday, 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time at youtube.com slash linuxcast. We'll see you all next week. 